So, Mr. June, what can I say about Mr. June? Gene Ingersoll is director of collections at McWayne and has been for how many years? Uh, 20. Books. And McWayne's been there, what? 20? Since 1998. Right? Plus right. 1999. Now, I'm sure if you have kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, you probably know the McWayne Center. And it just keeps getting better and better. Um, his background is, of course, as an archaeologist and paleontologist and historian, really, with lots of uh, 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 peer reviewed publications in different fields. And uh, you started by investigating Homo erectus in East Africa. I'd love to hear more about that, Native America. And he personally studies the fossil vertebrate diversity in Alabama. So I think the most fascinating part of your research is the fossil sharks that you do. And that's your most recent area of study. Yes, yes. About 10 years now. Yeah. In the sharks. He's going to talk more about what he's found. And from what I understand, a lot of things that have been collected over history. It resides in your collection, and you, you're using modern technologies to look at old collections too, to kind of find new things about fossils. So that is amazing to me. If you can, welcome to Hoover. Oh, yes, that's right. I was supposed to do that. Thank you, everybody, for showing up this evening. Um, and so, yes, my name is Gene Eversall. I oversee the Natural History Department in the McWayne Science Center. Um, if you've been to McWayne, I'm the guy that oversees the dinosaur floor. I'm the nerd. I have a house spot in the glass. Um, but now you know me, so you can knock on the back and take a look. Uh, so, I study bird paleontology in Alabama. So, I study the things with fat bones. Well, you know, I collect clams and snails and those kinds of things. They're interesting, but that's not what most research is in. A lot of our research over the past few years has actually been on Megalodon. Um, I think everybody here is familiar with, with Megalodon. Um, Megalodon, outside of Transverse Rex, is probably the most popular fossil out there. Uh, the media has really run wild uh, with depictions of Megalodon and television shows and so forth. Um, how many people here saw this movie, The Meg? Anybody? Right. It was a ridiculously horrible depiction of this wonderful and fascinating shark. Um, I didn't like a single thing about the movie, but then I saw it six times. The <laughs> thing <laughs> 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 about it is fascinating just because how large did this fossil shark look. Um, this is a little too large. Uh, <laughs> this is a little too large. That one was big, but it's a little, uh, little ridiculous. Uh, it's actually a, a horrible, horrible. Um, mockumentary to kind of Discovery Channel a number of years ago about a fishing boat off the coast of South Africa that got attacked by a megalodon. And they thought it was great on Discovery Channel, but it was actually all you know, fictional and so forth. And the end result was it was still fear in people and they went out to fish on us, which is uh, why I don't like those things. So I can't really get talks like this kind of facts about that. That sharks are nothing to be feared. Actually, more people get killed by cows every year than they do. Uh, for sharks, but yet there's no show during Shark Week on you know, cats attack. Unfortunately, it's all you know, negative things about coral uh, sharks. But you know, here, here's the facts on, on Megalodon. All right, so Megalodon is, is extinct. All right, sorry, Discovery Channel. Megalodon went extinct over two and a half million years ago, right before the beginning of the last ice age. Uh, apparently, this couldn't tolerate uh, global temperature drops, um, ocean temperatures dropping, and so they, they, they went extinct. If Megalodon was still alive today, there would be no whales, there would be no marine mammals, uh, we would not go out in the water. Uh, <laughs> they were ferocious, ferocious, and meat eating sharks. Um, one of the largest predatory sharks living today is the great white, they max out around 20 feet long. Megalodon are estimates are up to 60 feet, so three times larger than the biggest great whites that are out there. So when you watch you know, Shark Week, and I'm sure everybody here does, and you see those. Gigantic sharks off the coast of South Africa jumping out of the water and you know, catching fish seals and everything. Those are the biggest of the big great whites out there. Three times big. I mean, this is almost as big as a sperm whale, <laughs> which is just amazing. 70 tons, which is more than 10 elephants. Absolutely huge. They're going to school bus. Absolutely huge sharks. 
So that was the most largest shark that I ever lived, but hands down one of the largest predators. So we can think about things like trend source tax analysis or these things with more. So the only one that comes close is probably this one in, in terms of size, which is a large predator. But what we mainly know about Megalodon is, is teeth. Um, Megalodon, just like all other sharks and rays and skates that are out there, they're cartilaginous, meaning they have cartilaginous skeleton. That doesn't preserve very well in the fossil record. Teeth, on the other hand, is that one that have actually Harder than bone, it's made out of dentine and enamel. Um, bone, it's still a tissue. It, it can break down. It does preserve a whole lot better than cartilage does, which is a very, very soft and spongy tissue. But mostly what we know about Necrodonis is from their teeth. Uh, people don't realize that uh, <laughs> Necrodon probably had 250 to 300 teeth in its mouth at one time. So what you're seeing here in this early reconstruction, this is actually taking a Necrodon tooth and scaling it up to the size of basically taking a great white jaw and scaling it up to the size of one of these larger teeth. I actually brought one of these, you can actually see. Normally I pass this around, but we'll wait till the end of the clip. But this is a small tooth. This is small. I've seen them up to eight inches tall, so it's very larger than this. Absolutely huge shark. So the Smithsonian put together this reconstruction of, of the jaw, uh, it's going to be absolutely gigantic here. Where six nerves can fit in its mouth at one time. <laughs> but what you're seeing here is what's called a functional row of teeth. There's actually four replacement rows behind that that rotate out. Where Megalodon, if we got the full adulthood, could probably have gone through 20 to 30,000 teeth in a lifetime. Wow. That's why we get Megalodon teeth around the world. So they can generate teeth this large unbelievably fast. All right, so looking at modern sharks, a lot of these sharks, especially with things like bull sharks and such, where they can produce a tooth in the back of the mouth and have a rotation small out of the leaf. So it's absolutely amazing. Uh, which is why I think that was fantastic to study. And, you know, being the largest shark that ever lived, they were circling global beach, they swam on all the world's oceans. So if you just happen to have deposits, you know, basically spikes you can like with you know, rocks or strata that like date between 23 and 2.6 million years old, you, you have a chance to find that without teeth. So, Megalodon, the reason for Megalodon goes back several hundred years, where Megalodon's a member of what's known as Odidontids, basically meaning megatooth sharks. All right, so there's more than just you know, one species of these things with respect to their teeth. And they call them megatooth sharks because the teeth are just absolutely huge. Call it any of Megalodon, I mean, these are the largest shark teeth you're going to find out there, but there are some that rival that size. Well, Odidontids, this particular family here, this thing was actually erected by a Russian cannon called this from Leon Lippmann. So 1964, all right, he's studying sharks out there in Kazakhstan. And you know, he's blown away by these big teeth. And there's multiple species of these. And he's saying, you know, these should all belong to the same family. A lot of things that they have in common, not just their size, but in general shape and so forth. But he's a really a cutting edge paleontologist where, you know, here he is here smoking a cigarette out and you know, get some a little bit there. <laughs> Um, but he took it a step further, all right? So first of all, he said that there are several species out there that should be part of this family. The species that have already been named. Uh, the first one is a totus of weevils, all right? So these ones you generally get in rocks or sediments that are between 60 and 48 million years old. All right, this is one of the most popular shark teeth out there. If you look at people with shark teeth necklaces, eight out of 10 are gonna be this. You go to gift shops. <laughs> These things, they get them by the millions um, out of Morocco, and then they sell them commercially all these big shops around the world. Uh, they're big, big triangular. They have these things called lateral cusplets. They're side fangs, really sharp and smooth cutting edges. Uh, if you go to gift shops anywhere down Dolphin Island, Gulf Shores, every single one of them will have just buckets full of these teeth. Uh, anytime you go to a rock and mineral show, you're going to see these piles of, of these things. Um, so I, I call this the gift shop. <laughs> but then you get this one that not many people have heard of. Part of these are Right, absolutely huge. I've seen these back down around three inches tall, which is, is large, the largest great length you've ever seen. Um, these ones here, I've seen four to five inches tall. So they're really approaching this size, if not larger. All right, so that is a huge shark tooth. So obviously, I too would call this a negative shark just because of the size. But look, this one also has these side bangs. But now look at this, it has very interesting state night like serrations. This one's a little bit smaller, has those side fangs. I would say these are probably related, but this does not have those serrations. It has the smooth cutting edges. 
And I believe I also said megalodons definitely part of this. Unbelievably gigantic triangular teeth, no side fangs, but yet it has these serrated edges. But you know, Whitman was really cutting edge for his time, where he took it a little bit further, we're placing something in a you know, certain family because they have morphological similarities. Every paleontologist is doing that. But Whitman took it a step further and suggested that not only are these related and in the same family, but because you find them at different time periods, these 60 to 48, these 48 to about 35 million, these 23 to two and a half, he suggested that these are actually part of the same lineage. All right, so basically, this is what Megalodon looked like 60 million years ago, eventually evolved into this, and then eventually evolved into this. Now, generally, when you study negative sharks, you're going around the world getting your sample from all these various places, and so it's very difficult to test something like this. However, Whitman wasn't basing this off of nothing. His work out in Kazakhstan, he actually had a hillside. Where he was finding, so what Whitman suggested was this. This is what he was observing. All right, they started with these unserrated teeth with these lateral cusps, these side heads. Over the course of several million years, they get serrated cutting edges and they get larger in size, even little side bends, get little serrations off. Then he suggested millions of years later, they actually got larger, lost their side bends, and kept their serrations. But this, this was actually based on his research out in Kazakhstan. Where he had a single hillside where at the base he was finding a codice of Lequis teeth, and at the top he was finding these auriculatus teeth, and in between he was finding all these intermediates going from this to this, seeing this one right into this. Now, unfortunately, Whitman's hillside wasn't high enough where you didn't have young enough you know, rocks or sediments to get the megalodon, but at least this part right here of a codice of Lequis evolving into auriculatus seems to be. Legitimate. So Whitman published his results in 1964, but unfortunately, uh, it was in a um, <laughs> very obscure Russian journal in Cyrillic. So it was really hard for his ideas to really get out there, especially amongst the other shark researchers. Um, it wasn't until around the 1980s, there was a French family publicist named uh, Henri Capella, who really started looking back at Whitman's work and said, you know, I really think he, he did all this stuff. Right and Whitman got the original. Um, you know, Russian volumes that Glickman was writing on, on the Negative Few Sharks and got them translated, which was no chore. You know, back in the 80s, there's no Google Translate back then. You had to <laughs> really do your diligence there. Um, and then he started studying the Negative Few Sharks around the world, and he was the one who really popularized Glickman's notion that, yes, this is part of the lineage. But again, the issue was that he was finding all these intermediates they're from different places in the world. All right, so you can argue that these are just different sharks from different places. That you know we are putting them in this lineage, as opposed to being a true lineage. Um, but that, that's the difficulty because it's hard to find one place that has this huge span of geologic time exposed. Um, it really get in one place. Well, uh, that, that's where I started on this. So obviously, I'm, I'm right here in Alabama. Um, we all live here in Alabama. We've all seen a map of Alabama. Can anybody tell me what sort of map this is? Anybody ever seen this colorful thing online before? Yep. Geologic map. Geologic map, exactly. All right, so basically, if you took off all the trees and the houses and the cracker barrels and so forth, <laughs> these are the layers of rocks that are lit, that just laying on the surface in Alabama. Right? So you don't have to dig to get these. If you just go up and down I 65 and you see the rock wall and you start driving through Montgomery and seeing the white shot on the side of the roads or going down south and seeing the sand and stuff on the side of the river. That's what this is showing, where every color represents what's called a rock formation or sediment formation, where it's a type of rock or sediment that was laid down at a certain period of time. It could be a sandstone, a limestone, a chalk, it could be marble, or they just give it a name and give it a color on this map. So what's unique about Alabama and what people don't seem to realize is that we are kind of the ideal place to study negative sharks and work with fossils in general. All right, so not only do we have a nearly complete Cenozoic sequence, all right, but almost all our formations are sediment. All right, so let me unpack it a little bit. All right, so we have right here in Alabama the most complete geologic call. Meaning if you take all the rocks from the beginning of life until now and you stack them up like a stack of books, we have more volumes of that book than any other state. All right, so you can take geologic history and break it down into three areas. All right, there's what's called the Paleozoic, 
which is all the time periods before the dinosaurs. There's the Mesozoic, which is all the time periods during the dinosaurs. Then there's the Cenozoic, which is all the time periods after the dinosaurs. Right? So Alabama is very unique where we have all three. In fact, all these rocks up here, we're standing right now, and all the rocks north of us, all Paleozoic before the time of the dinosaurs. Our dinosaur age rocks, all right here, in the middle part of the state, under known as the Black Belt. So if you're hunting for dinosaurs, sorry, Huntsville, wrong place. Sorry, Gulf Island, wrong place. To find dinosaurs, you can have dinosaur age rocks. Right around here, right around here, you get to like Priester's Pecans if you're going down I 65. That's the transition between the time of the dinosaurs and the time after the dinosaurs. Set it up. Well, right around here is around 100 million years, and straight on down is every single time period, 100 million years during the dinosaurs, to every time period afterwards in order. All right, this is the most complete sequence here in North America for the last 100 million years, plus all the earlier stuff. Unbelievable. These are basically old beaches. This is the ancient Gulf of Mexico going back 100 million years. Ideal place to go hunt for fossils. People here from the Fossil Club, you've gone down here, you've gone to Trussell Street, you've gone to Point A Dam, all these places where you get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shark teeth in a day. Um, we get sharks and things up here as well. Some of the oldest sharks in the world are up here. But what's unique about Alabama is that not only is our sequence uh, nearly complete, almost all our rocks are sedimentary. All right? If you ever study geology, there's three major rock types. Rock type number one, igneous. Uh, those are the rocks that are coming out of volcanoes. All right? Fossils don't like lava. All right? So do we have volcanoes here in Alabama? No. <laughs> we do get some ash layers here and there, but then we don't have volcanoes here. Yeah, you don't have to deal with that. Metamorphic rocks, all right, second rock. All right, these are rocks that are generally miles down on the earth, and the pressures of the earth are heating these things up and warping them and so forth. Um, it's very interesting rocks that form that way. Well, we do have metamorphic rocks here. All these weird squiggles in this little triangle over here in East Alabama, it's called the Piedmont. All right, so these are the major metamorphic stuff. This is the one place in the state where you can find ice age things here, or ice age fossils, or lots of creeks and rivers and such. But if you're looking for other types of fossils, shark teeth and things, this is the one zone where probably not great to get. Um, however, if you want marble, so the finest marble in the world, so the common marble, the state rock, that way down here, that's metamorphic. If you like gold, we have active gold mines right now. You can go on this area, diamonds. This, this is where you go to make money, not where you really want to go for that fossils and shark teeth. But the rest of these rocks, all of these up here and all of these rocks and sediments down here, sedimentary. And as the name implies, it's sediments, compact sediments, which are limestone, they're sandstone, they're chalks. That's where fossils present. But those two factors alone, the most complete, you know, basically more tiny periods on the surface, nearly all sedimentary going to find, that'd be enough to say that, hey, we're the best place to find fossils. But <laughs> Alabama spent most of its geologic history underwater. All right, so from here on down, this is all marine, shallow ocean. One of the most biodiverse places on Earth today are big coral reefs. Well, this is almost the world's history of the past 100 million years of coral reefs. Then you get stuff up here, basically going from eh, about 200 million back to 500 million, a much older environments where the baby swamps or the shallow oceans or so forth, all up and down here. So what I generally tell people is if you want to pick the best geological tube in North America, Get an I-65 to rock it up in Huntsville. Drive straight on down to Mobile. Every one mile you drive south, you're actually going one million years forward in time. All those road cuts that you see on the side of I-65, by Lake Con, um, oh, whatever all those other uh, places going up here, it's getting younger and younger. The fossils are getting younger and younger. And then you get them all in order. It's all in sequence. It, it's amazing. So people ask me a lot, like, how come our surrounding states don't have this same stuff? Well, they have some. Um, Florida down here, you know, we share the coast with the Florida panhandle here. Well, Florida, these rocks extend over. These are the youngest of the young rocks. Right? You will never find a dinosaur in Alabama. They don't have a single rock from the time of the dinosaurs were before. It's all a much, much younger set of Most of them are older than 40 million years old. They have nothing from 41 million all back. <laughs> so, uh, Georgia, Georgia is dominated by people. All right, so once again, a lot of metamorphic rocks over there. Uh, they get some of these you know, older rocks here. The dinosaur race stuff kind of ends right here at the Chattahoochee River. So if you're in Georgia and you want to hunt dinosaur age fossils, you really you can come over to Alabama. But on the coast, they can get some younger stuff. So Georgia does get all three geologic eras. They're just not in sequence. 
right? and they're really choppy. They're what we call, they have a lot of what are called unconformities, missing gaps of time. Uh, Tennessee is a kind of a different situation where our dinosaur belt goes up in the northwest corner and it does go over western Tennessee. Uh, the rest of it, though, is older stuff, right? They have very, very, very few deposits that they come after the time of the dinosaur. They're almost exclusively Kelly's older than the dinosaur stuff. Mississippi, they share the black belt with us, but that basically they don't have <laughs> almost no rocks at all from before the time of the dinosaur. They share all these same layers with us. Those are our surrounding states. In the US, the only state that I can think that might even come close to having what we have here in Alabama would be Texas, just because they're so large. Difficult to study out there. Their coastal plain is nice, but all the other type periods are really jumbled up, uh, not very well studied, especially the older stuff. Um, Alabama is easy because if you just want to get younger stuff, you just go south. If you want to get older stuff, you just go north. But this became interesting to me when I started working here 20 years ago of just realizing how complete our geologic sequence is over the past 100 million years. Basically, this is one ocean. These are just the ancient shoreline that the Gulf of Mexico was here 100 million years ago and was just laid out for this present time. Uh, shoreline here. And so, same ocean through time. Talk about an ideal place to study the evolution of Megalodon. Oh my gosh. This is exactly what Whitman would have been looking for, just from really the waist out and see the evolution of the same chart. So that's what I started looking into about 10 years ago. All right, so what was great about Alabama is that most of these units here are extremely fossil buildings. I mean, it is, I've lived in places where there are no fossils. Every week, people send me photos or are bringing in you know, things that they find here in the state. A lot of times they're just rocks. If you pick up the thing next to that rock, it's probably going to be a fossil. I mean, we're just living on top of it. It is truly remarkable. All right, so this over the past 10 years alone has documented over 400 different species of fossil species of the state. Okay, over 400. That number is ridiculous. Okay, so let's take shark teeth. What states out there do you think of when you think of shark teeth? North Carolina. Okay, North Carolina, great state. Anybody else? Texas. Okay, Texas, another state that had a lot of shark teeth. Okay, what about Florida? Mm -hmm. All right, Florida's considered the shark teeth capital of the world. Um, in the professional community, people always recognize South Carolina. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, close to North Carolina, lots of stuff on the coast of South Carolina. Well, a big part of mine is, uh, of course, the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. He kind of keeps the inventory of fossils from bird fossils from Florida. He provided me his list of sharks and bony fish. It was 125. Right, so 125 different species in Florida. They're supposed to be the sharks in the capital of the world. A really good friend of mine that I published with a lot is the uh, state paleontologist at the South Carolina State Museum in Columbia. Um, so we, he studies sharks. He keeps his running list. South Carolina, in the professional community, is considered the number one state in the U.S. Their number is 150. I've already got over 400, so more than doubling the number one state in the U.S. And I'm just getting started. <laughs> so we're going to double or triple it by the time we're done, just because our geologic sequence is so complete and the sharks. For example, I can go up here, mines up here, or even the side of the highway. I can get little pieces of limestone. They take about 325 million years old. I've taken some of these just layers out of the road cut that you see up there by Coleman and such. I can dissolve that limestone in acid, and what's left is the teeth that are trapped inside. Well, these are some of the oldest sharks in the world. A lot of them are microscopic, where you just millimeter wide white teeth. <laughs> uh, when I broke down that rock, it made about two tablespoons of dirt, and I kicked out over 400 teeth from two tablespoons of dirt. Out of those, probably 60% of them are new species. <laughs> Where I can publish a paper with probably 30 or 40 new species because no one studies sharks at all, and no one studies the next one. <laughs> so, man, that, that's how it is. That's one rock about the size of my fist. So, um, and that's just one layer out of hundreds in North Alabama, and not including all of the steps. So you're saying the teeth of sharks? Yes. Or a, a real shark was that Microscope. small? Shark teeth today can be that small. It just depends on where they are now. All right, so well, long story short, when it comes to sharks, we're second to none. We're one of the best states, if not the best, in terms of fossil fish So I'm actually right now finishing up a gigantic textbook on fossil fishes from Alabama. Once that comes out next year or so, it'll cement us as the number one place in the U.S. So it's really something that we could be proud of as Alabamians of our record here. There's pretty few places in the world where you have a sequence this complete to study the evolution of one particular shark. 
So, but even before I started doing this 10 years ago, we had already recognized certain species of mega two sharks already here. For example, these black layers here, they date to what's known as the Paleocene. Right? This is the time period from just after the death of the dinosaurs. Right? So I mentioned priesters for cons. There's actually sites right, by priesters which exposes what's called the KPG contact. You should call it KP and uh, a KT contact. It's where that extinction, the meteorite hit the earth, wiped out 75% of life around the world. You can get an iridium layer, dinosaurs below it, not dinosaurs above it. Well, we have that contact here. And so this is a time period from just after. So imagine 75% of life wiped out overnight. Well, these rock layers here, these sediments preserve but survive that last 25%. But within these, we get a of leaks, a gift shop shark. All right, from these sediments that date around 60 to 55 million years old here now, now we can get these big old teeth just by walking in farmers' fields or along creeks and such. You can find them. And you can find them in abundance. Well, as you go, but what's interesting is this was considered by many to be the oldest ancestor of a mammal, but they don't get any in deposits older than 60 million years old. Well, in 1942, a French county ontologist came down to Alabama and was walking this northern park of the Paleocene, which is older from this southern part, which is where they're getting that gift shop shark. Well, he started finding these teeth that were shaped slightly different, found a whole handful of them, turned out to be a new species. These ones, they about 65 million years old, just after the death of the dinosaurs, right here in the northern part of this Paleocene belt. This thing became the oldest member in the Mangalow lineage. Right now, Alabama is the only place in the world where you can find this particular species. So even back then, I was kind of putting this on the map, knowing people would come to the door and figure out what was going on. Um, the second big tooth that, or the second main species that Glickman had in his lineage was practically the Riculatus. Right, these date to the Eocene, so you know, right around 45 million years ago. These are Eocene rocks in the state. If you go down here, places like the Andalusia or Tapico Landing, those types of places, you can find these. And, and I've seen them in some mines down here. I can just call them. I mean, absolutely huge, the gigantic side bank ball. So, even before I started, you know, we had those three species. So, what I started doing was, was testing Glickman's hypothesis that these things were actually part of the lineage, starting with, uh, well, actually, Mediavia, but oblique was to Ridgelot. We have these two species here in Alabama from different layers of sediment. Can I go to sediments that date in between where we find these and in between this and find that transition? I can actually test this. I can actually test evolutionary theory to see if we actually have transitional showing that this is all this. Makes sense, right? All I gotta do is go start here, find some of these, move a little further south, just be able to find that. So to test this, I kind of had to come up with my own hypothesis on what I thought this would look like. All right, so here we have these things, they act that around three inches tall, unserrated, have side fangs. Then they get bigger, up to five inches tall, serrated, serrated side fangs. What would this thing in the middle look like? Any thoughts? Um, it might have the beginnings of serrations. Okay, not quite good thought. This so, you know, trying to acquire them, absolutely. Anybody else want to throw something out there? Okay, five things, so yeah, it definitely keeps them. But what about size? <laughs> <laughs> What's the relative size difference? These are about three inches, max out about the big ones get about three, the big ones here get around five inches. So yeah, you, you, you can something kind of in the middle, maybe yeah. something max mm -hmm. out of four inches. Okay, that was my hypothesis in fact. Something that was maybe sloppily serrated or maybe starting to get serrations in the middle, but something also intermediate to size. So I went out looking for it and found it. And deposited the data around 48 million years old, found this thing called the Cartlidge Ashwaticus. This just happened to be the exact species that Glickman found on his hillside, where the base had a bleakless, the top had a reticulatus, in the middle, he named this thing called Ashwaticus. So don't be thrown off by the different tooth shapes here. That's just what's called heterodonty. So sharks, just like us, depending on where you are in the mouth, the teeth are going to be shaped different. So a tooth like this in Megalodon, I can tell you right now that this is going to be an upper anterior tooth. The upper teeth get wider than the lower teeth. 
I can also tell you this is going to be near the middle of the mouth because it's so symmetrical. In the upper teeth, as you start getting towards the jaw hinge, the teeth get smaller. The smallest teeth are at the jaw hinge. If you have big teeth like this at the jaw hinge, you start getting closer. So the teeth get progressively smaller. And the further away you get from it, it's called the symphysis, the middle part. The biggest teeth, the fancy teeth, are the ones in the front. Those are the prize make it up. When you get into the jaw hinge, they're actually wider than they are tall. So a tooth like this here in the middle, this is going to be an upper cheek tooth. You can see how it's starting to bend. Once you start getting to the jaw hinge, it's going to be very, very wide and very, very short crown. And so this one here is narrow, but it's actually very thick. This is actually a lower tooth from the middle of the mouth. So they're not as wide as the uppers, but they're thicker. So you can start actually framing signing together the dentitions of these prehistoric sharks. Now, people are also thrown off by the color differences. That has to do with whatever the surrounding geology is, whatever minerals are dissolved that are preserving these things, it takes on that color. So, yes? What would you think? Evolutionary reason for this duration, I mean, for them to be developed. Is can you postulate that? Good question, and we're gonna get into that in a minute. Okay. <laughs> so so this is very interesting here where I was able to show exactly what Glickman is showing in Kazakhstan, right here in Alabama. But what I was able to do was because our sequence is complete for the past hundred million years, we can put numerical dates on our layers. So meaning. I can start dating when these events are happening. So, wow. Now, there's also other intermediates that I'm finding in between here to really show this straight into this. Wow, it's just ideal. It's very, very, very cool. So, I started looking at this stratigraphically to see what was going on. All right, so what I mean by stratigraphically is if you take these block layers we have in the state and you put names on them and you stack them up in order like a stack of books, you can turn it into a chart like this. All right, so. Here's all our, here's certain layers from what's called the, the Eocene. Right? So these things are 40 to 50 million year old uh, rock layers that we have here in Alabama, and they're all stacked up. So if you go out to sites, if you go to a place what's called the Hatchetigbee Formation or the Tallahatta Formation, even ones that are slightly older, all the teeth are unserrated, meaning those serrations have not evolved yet. But what's very interesting is there's a little sliver of time right here. At the top of what we call NP14. Okay, these are nanoplankton zones where plankton are microscopic. A good example of how microscopic it is, they call them nanoplankton because if you go down to the black belt, you go to like the models, and you see the white chalk on the side of the road. If you get a sugar cube size, sugar cube size sample of that little piece of chalk, there's 30 billion nanoplankton, billion in that one sugar cube size sample. <laughs> Well, these nanoplankton's occur in combinations around the world, but they also live for very short periods of time. So every oil company employed, employs paleontologists who identify these because this helps you date the layers. <laughs> we have global correlation. So right now, like ExxonMobil out in the Gulf of Mexico has paleontologists on their rigs looking at deep cores, looking for certain nanoplankton combinations so they can say, yes, that's the right age to find you know, oil, let's go ahead and drop a ring right there. <laughs> so, right, so what's interesting is this, back to this, right here at the top of NP14, this is what I'm getting, the actual life stuff, the stuff with the very sloppy serrations. If I go back, it does have serrations, but I call them sloppy serrations, where if you look at this one under the microscope, all the serrations are the same size, equal distance apart, equal width, just like a state line. Unbelievably great for cutting me. This one here was sloppy. You put it under the scope and you get a big one and then a big gap and then a tiny one and another tiny one and then a huge one. What? Not very effective cut, cutting edge. It's like it's trying to figure out, you know, at, how serration should work. But stratigraphically, when you're looking at this, they're intermixing with these unserrated ones. So that was a, um, that's an awesome belt in, in my head. Where, what does this mean? Where we get, some that have these primitive serrations and other ones with no serrations. But what it told me was that we had a whole big diversity of these unserrated things where certain species started getting serrations, but they didn't get serrations, they got, they got off like there's a little extinction event, like between what's called the Calahatic formation and the Lizard formation at the top of this NP14. I don't quite know what's going on here, but whatever was happening environmentally. Habitat wise, if you were a Medicaid shark and you didn't acquire serrations, you were dead. Because <laughs> right after that, fully serrated. 
All right, so this is this became very interesting to look at it from this perspective of basically the evolution of time, where there's a misconception that evolution is gradual. All right, so with the evolution of these sharks, you just see it slowly gradient into another, where you know, for millions of years, going back 65 million years up until 48, you get unserrated things that all basically look the same, but then all of a sudden, floppy serration, fully serrated. All right, so this little event right here is just something quick with environment happening environmentally or climatically forcing this change, adapt, and go extinct. All right, so the nature has this wonderful mechanism in place. This is what we're seeing right here. So from an evolutionary biological perspective, we call this punctation equilibrium. All right, a quick burst forward in evolution. If you've ever seen like the X-Men movies? Not your head if you've seen them. Okay, do you have Professor X, Charles Xavier always yakking them out? Quick burst in evolution, create the mutants for all you nerds there. <laughs> That's what he's talking about, punctated equilibrium. All right, something was forcing these things to adapt to their environment, and it's happening unbelievably quickly. Stable environment here, something happening here, not stable again for millions and millions of years. So I'm not tracking this in, in our fossil record of wow, this little cool event here. You get into the list information, you will no longer get on screens. It's a negative chart, it's going to have some change. And the only place you get these primitive ones are right. <laughs> Very good. So, what about the second half of this? This is the part that Glickman really just had to hypothesize on, really had to just guess on because his hillside didn't go up high enough to get young enough sediments to get Megalodon. off. So, could Auriculatus evolve into Megalodon? So, these ones backed out, I've seen them seven, eight inches tall. These ones backed out around five. All right, side fangs, the lateral cusp of there, serrated, no side fangs, bigger, but still have serrations. All right, so I can go to time periods between you know, 47 and 23 and look at this intermediate to test this. What would that look like? You might see a loss of side cusp. Okay, so like what, like getting smaller or just, just fall off a minute or uh, no, just getting smaller. Okay. Less Okay, let's pronounce the thought. Okay, what else? Did you expect to see anything else from the same way? Again, the bigger size and somewhere in between. Right, okay, something with intermediate size. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I started hunting rocks that are around 35 million years old to see if I could find this thing, and then I found it. <laughs> it's a species that has been named from elsewhere. You'll find this particular species called Chupacensis. You get them off the coast of California, you can get them in South Carolina. Uh, found it right here in Alabama. So what's interesting is, okay, this one is a lower tooth, or this is an upper tooth, but it's just off the middle. It's kind of the beginning of your cheek teeth, which is why it's so wide, but not as tall. But these get huge. They get very, very big, almost a function of size of any of I've seen these six inches tall. But look here, the side effects. Exactly as you would have thought, they're reducing, getting this vision. All right, a little later in time, they almost lose them completely. You'll see just a little slit down here showing that they used to be there. What? <laughs> this is exactly what you expect to see if this actually evolved into this. And the time period went in between. What in the world? Lipton, whatever it was 60 years ago, was correct. Um, and here we have it right here in Alabama. Wow. All right. So when you look at this geographic, all right. So this is the top of that last graph chart I showed you, what's called Eocene. Then you transition into the Oligocene. All right, so this auriculitis, which we start getting oh, right around 48 million years ago, they stay the same all the way up until you get around up here around 33 million, around maybe about 38 million. Right, so almost, well, actually, younger than that. Um, so million, tens of millions of years, they're staying the same. Chupatensis, all right, I've got one tooth right now that actually came from this rock layer called the Chickasahay Limestone out of St. Stephen's Quarry in Washington County. So, Right now, you know, this is my only reference, but right here, you're losing lateral customs. All right, they're reducing the size, the teeth are getting bigger. So what I'm trying to figure out right now as we speak is what's going on right here, what's called the viral function. All right, so does this chupatensis, does it actually show up a little bit earlier? Or does these guys, you know, persist a little bit longer? And then you get another punctated equilibrium with it? I, I don't know, those are questions I'm trying to answer right now. Are there more intermediates that could be in here? I don't know. Um, so right now, you know, I'm heavily investigating these on both the Alabama and Mississippi side to see if I can start going in place here. Um, 
So we're now one step away from, from Eglodon, all right here in Alabama. Great. All right, so right now, what I'm able to trace is the CODIS obliquus evolving into what we call Ashuaticus, then evolving into Auriculatus, and evolving into Chilotensis. All right, we're the only, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. What's the modern species that's closest? Uh, these guys went extinct. The closest modern analog would be a great white, but they're completely unrelated, even to the things. So, this is just a whole family that went extinct 2.6 million years ago. So, um, so the work really isn't that. Two flies, um, great whites, great whites have big triangular teeth, but it's uh, what we call convergent evolution. It's the same um, characteristics evolving in two completely different species, just because they probably have a similar habitat, similar diet. Do um, great modern species have side crusts? Many, uh, many do. Side fangs are generally, um, in modern sharks, used for fishing. So imagine teeth lined up in the upper and the lower, they're shaped pretty similar. All right, so when you have a wiggly fish in your mouth, not only is your main cusp big, now you have these side fangs when you put the mouth, trap that fish in there. When you start getting serrations, all right, big triangulars, big triangular teeth with serrations is ideal for a high blubber content to answer your question, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is what we see in great white sharks. All right, so they're eating it. Seals and you know, man, whatever marine mammals are around that have this high water, ideally I, I adapted for that. That seems to be what's happening here. We're seeing kind of a transition in what these mega fish sharks are eating. These smaller ones from just after the time of the dinosaurs are probably eating big fish. But now all of a sudden, when you start getting to these time periods here, all of a sudden we get loads and loads and loads of whales showing up. All right, so we actually get we actually get fossil whale vertebrae with megalodon two sparks on They were eating the whales. By the time you get to this time period, which I'll go back and actually show you, what's interesting is, is that this is it's very tropical and marine in, in South Alabama, and we quickly transition into an ice age. An earlier ice age than the one you're thinking of with the mammals and saber tooth cats. Um, so I see that it's, it's really no surprise that all of a sudden you see another kind of big jump forward, a big change in these teeth, where they call it the greenhouse to ice house transition. We really went from tropical to almost geologically overnight to, to an ice age. But right around here, where we start finding chubitensis, manatees like crazy. Manatee fossils everywhere. I, I know people on um, um, Mississippi that live on top of this rock area. Their garage is just full of manatee rib bones. It's called the more Where do you find these teeth? Manatees. So they are probably transitioning from you know, eating whales to not eating you know, Manatees and other types of whales. The bigger ones will live here, the bigger whale species. So, anyway, so back to this. Here we are transitioning through time, probably a change in diet, spurred on by um, changes in climate, which then changing the habitat, changing the food sources, and here these mega food sharks are adapting through time. So, very cool. Only place in the world we're going to get this entire sequence going from 60 million years old, 60 million years ago, to Oh, right around 30, it's pretty, pretty long. Uh, but there's more. All right, this is really just the beginning. So here's what's going on right now. This is the current focus of the recent negative uh, research. All right, so the first thing I need to figure out is the Danian Oligonics. Okay, so the Danian is the first time period after the extinction of dinosaurs. All right, so negative sharks are from this, in this time period around the world. Boy, you start getting these, these big negative sharks. They obviously survived. They had an ancestor from before the time of the dinosaurs that actually survived the extinction of that. Now all of a sudden they're the top predator, right? They really start diversifying, going into these ecological niches where they're the top predator and, and they're just not only diversifying, but you just, <laughs> you know, just really start getting there. So what I had to figure out is this at Totus Mediatus. All right, so this is more recent reach that came down to Wilcox County in 1942. Like all these two here, named it this particular species. But there's problems with this. Okay, so these teeth are all out of Smithsonian. So I've traveled to DC just to go check out and figure out what they actually were. Um, so he collected two batches of teeth. I'm not showing these other ones here. So he collected a whole bunch from a slightly younger time period in South Dakota. Then he collected these much older ones from, um, from Alabama. Well, these ones here all have to be misidentified. These are from 60 million old, million old rock layers as opposed to 65 million old rock layers. So five million years younger. They turned out to be that Atotus obliquus. All right, so that left these. These is what Larish said was Atotus mediatus. He said that 
This particular negative star had a whole lot of heterodox, basically get all these different shaped teeth in the back. Now, shark dentitians can get crazy when you start thinking of tiger sharks and things. Um, not so much negative sharks, they don't, they're not this drastic. So I had to go back to the Smithsonian and check these out, and yeah, the reach messed up. Where <laughs> these are actually, this is a new species of tiger shark, or same tiger shark, and I had more of them I could name that species. These turned out to be all from a smaller species of same tiger shark called Brachycarcarius. But this one here, this one here, and then this one, definitely negative two sharks, but they weren't the Potus oblique, which is the oldest one known before this one. All right. All right. So what I have to do is formalize this name. I have to basically read this for a bit, all right, and say that ignore all these other ones, ignore the ones on that second plate from South Dakota. This is what a totus mediated this actually is. I have to take that step before we can actually use this name. But it's an important step because this is the only species so far from the name. Right? So once I put a name on these Alabama ones, any other place around the world that has similar teeth can now put a name on the things. All right, it's the same age. All right. So, but what's interesting is to do this, when I started, you know, I wanted to get my name. I don't have to travel to Washington, D.C. to see these things every time. But I started going out to some of the same sites that Larish was collecting in the 40s. And yeah, we started finding some more of these things. <laughs> like, oh. But they are crazy diverse. So again, you know, this is top predator at the time, and they're going into all these different habitats and so forth, and really diversifying, really speciating, where we're getting a whole bunch of different species. There's going to be more than just this mediator shark that I've got to figure out. So I've got to get hundreds of these and start Frankensteining together the dentitions, and that's how you can tell your species. So there's a chance here that these all fit into one mouth, or maybe this is a lower tooth in the middle of the mouth, and maybe this is a cheek tooth from the upper. And maybe these are both, you know, upper teeth from the middle of the mouth because they're slightly wider. Or there's a chance that these are all new species. <laughs> right now, I don't have enough to know. I really have to go hunt these Danian deposits in South Alabama to really start resolving this. All right, so that's one part of the lineage that I got to do some work on. Then I got to figure out what's happening during that ice age, the Olympus. All right, where we get the things with the big cuspids here that are serrated, and then they start losing their cuspids here. What's happening in the middle? Does this continue on? Does this continue down? Or does this stay the same and then it's pumped to equilibrium a quick change? We don't know. How long does this tubatensis thing survive? Because right above this should be mega up there. So do we have transitionals up there as well? All that stuff I need to start looking into further. But what's difficult about that is that you have to find to find those transitionals to tubatensis, you have to look at the legacy age sediments. Here we are in Alabama, one little squiggle. Run through the state. <laughs> I don't have much space to look. However, this is the most complete Oligocene sequence in North America, right? It's a very quick time period, but from the beginning of the Oligocene in the middle and in the upper part, we have all. So we are the ideal place to see what's happening during that ice age with negative sharks. So I spent a lot of time hunting these sediments down here. All right, so that's kind of a big thing. So we're the ideal place to figure out what's happening during the Oligocene. But then I got to figure out. What's happening before the extinction of the dinosaurs? Okay, so Megalon just didn't, or these ancestors, the Atodus, they didn't appear out of nowhere. There had to be something that was alive during the time of the dinosaurs that survived the extinction event because they followed with the period of sharks. Well, one of the most common sharks during the last period of the dinosaurs, the Cretaceous, is this genus called Cradolamina. All right, so Cradolamina. My gosh, there's about maybe 12 or 14 different species that you can find globally. The first one seemed to appear in the fossil record about 100 million years ago. If you get them right up to the extinction event, and what I'm seeing now is that some of these survive. We're in Alabama alone, I'm able to piece together the dentitions from at least five different species. This one here, this is an upper cheek tooth, and then this is going to be a lower kind of middle tooth here. Um, this is from what I call the Bryant sharks. I named this one back in 2018. Uh, named this after uh, Bear Bryant Jr. So a lot of these were found on his property. I was trying to get football tickets, but it didn't work. <laughs> so there's no football coaches out there. So I'll get the eye of the for free for that. <laughs> but another one is Cradle Land Hat Knot. Okay, this was originally identified uh, out in Sweden. We also have them here. Right? This is the, really the second record of this in North America. 
Maracana. These are actually originally found in Morocco. We have these here, but then we have these ones, right? These ones don't have names. I've got a name. This one I've got a nearly complete dentition with about 200 teeth and actually some preserved vertebrae. I just haven't gotten around to naming this one yet. I don't quite have enough of these yet to really piece together the full dentition, um, but once I get more, I should be able to name this, giving us at least five distinct pregolamas in the right here in Alabama. Now, what's very interesting about this turned out to be the Bryant shark. Right? Out of all the sharks from all these cradle lamina sharks from before the time, before the death of that source, and then from after the extinction of that, <coughs> this species here seems to be the closest to the survivors, meaning this is probably going to survive the extinction of that. This right now is very, very likely the oldest confirmed member in the Nebuchadnezzar population. So that's cool. That's right here now. Right? So take that everywhere else. <laughs> but one of my big steps is actually finding Megalodon. All right, so back in 1889, the first Megalodon teeth were reported from Alabama. They were actually at the British Museum. They were collected by our first state paleontologist back in the, 19, the 1840s, shipped over to the British Museum for identification, sat into a drink, sat in drawers until about 50, 50 years later, this guy named Albert Woodward went and said, Oh, some of these are Megalodon teeth. Alabama apparently has Megalodon. Well, 1956, another British paleontologist went and re examined those teeth. So Carol White went and said, oh, okay. we were messed up. The labels got mixed up. All those Megalodon teeth are actually from Malta. Oh, it wiped off our only record of Megalodon. Right? So right now, there's no confirmed Megalodon teeth that have been found in Alabama. In fact, not a single Megalodon tooth has ever been found in the entirety of the Gulf Coast plain of the U.S., meaning not in Texas, not in Arkansas, not in Mississippi, not in Louisiana, not Alabama, not in Panhandle of Florida. The ones in Florida are coming from the Atlantic side. Right, so why not? Well, a lot of it is that people down here in the southern states aren't studying the right time periods, but also the Gulf of Mexico is a very shallow basin. Right, so maybe the world's biggest shark that one would venture into these shallow waters, but at the same time, we're getting people that are almost this size, 100 miles in. So Megalodon should be here. Um, it's, it's funny, I, I know Megalodon should be down there. <laughs> um, I'll tell you a funny story in the middle, in a minute here, but. To find Megalodon, you've got to hunt sediments that date to the Miocene of Colorado, right? So you're basically looking for sediments that date between 23 and 2.6 million years ago. All right, so you got to look for these. Anything older, you're not going to find Megalodon. All right, so geographically, when you look at the time chart here, here's the range of Megalodon. You're not going to get them here in the Ligocene. This is that tube of Tensis. You're not going to get them afterwards because they went extinct. All right, so, uh, so we got to hunt here. So, so these earlier ones from the Miocene, right? They say 23 million year old to 2.3 uh, We have those rocks here, those we'll sediments that date to that time period, all southwest Alabama. I actually gave a very similar talk a few years back to the uh, Society of Alabama Geologists. Right? It's a licensing conference where they have to get continuing education credits to keep their geology license. Well, I went there specifically with 200 geologists, Alabama geologists in the room. And I asked, hey, has anybody ever worked down here and come across a giant megalodon tooth? <laughs> well, afterwards, a 70 year old guy came up to me and says, Yeah, I used to work for a pipe company just worked on the wheel down here. First day on the job, we're walking this big trench that we put in the ground. And my boss says, Hey, come here. He got his pocket knife and popped a six inch megalodon tooth out of the wall. I was like, Why? That's exactly where we should be. So I said, Well, first of all, where's your boss? Where's that tooth? Second of all, where was that site? Well, he said that was back in the 70s, and his boss has been there for 30 years. <laughs> and two weeks later, they filled in that pipeline. But at least showed me on a map where it was. So that tells me that they're there. Right? Some people down there probably have them on the mantles in their living room and don't know the scientific significance. Right? So I'm hunting these like crazy, where every summer I teach down the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. I teach recent shark and, and ray classes down there. But that's kind of my home base. They give me a research house, and then I go out and I'm trying to explore these areas here. So I mean, getting access into what are called borrow pits. They're basically these companies that are digging to get stuff out, either for you know, aggregates or line driveways or, or whatnot, hoping that they dig down deep enough to get to these Miocene layers. Um, but the problem is that you know, not a single shark tooth from this time period has ever been found in the state of Alabama. <laughs> but right over in the, in the Ford Panhandle, these same layers extend over. There's a guy who did his dissertation down there in 2009 that I have a whole bunch of. So we're just not looking in the right places. 
Right? So they're obviously going to be that. Right? They're, they're not all Florida Gator fans and not a Benjamin Moore for the line. You know, there are these shots. You know, you care less. Right? So, um, so, so, so I know they're there. But this past summer, I might have finally identified the deposits where it'll work. All right, so right on the western side of Mobile Bay, I got a tip from a person at the Sea Lab. You don't talk to this person who runs an oyster farm because <laughs> it definitely looks like this and it's sand, but our, the hurricane last summer came, the one hurricane came and wiped off all the sand <laughs> and exposed this almost solid clay. This should not be there. All right, this clay is such a rich clay, the whole thing's been going there and pressing this and making pots and things. So that kind of like, okay, I gotta go check that out. So I ran over to see this site. I had to wait for the tides to go out. I got to go check this out for about three or four minutes before thunderstorms were rolling. <laughs> and then the water went back up. But right before we got rained out, I right, hear this solid clay again, about a four foot section of it, but yet it's still going underwater, so it's probably thicker than this. Right on the top here is finding fossils. <laughs> so here is a true fossil deposit that potentially dates to the time period of Megalodon. So now I can start tracing this, basically that same latitude, just start walking creeks at that latitude, even on the Mississippi side, to see if I can trace this layer of the fossils. First big tip there. All right, so it's very possible that what we discovered right over here is what's called the Pascagoula Formation. All right, so when you read the descriptions or you will see the Pascagoula Formation over in Mississippi, they say a bluish gray clay with fossils in it. Yes, that's exactly what we got here. It's probably the same, same way. All right, so I need to get back down there. I'll be down there in the next, in the next few weeks looking for not only Megalodon, but a key fossil I'm looking for is called Rangia Jaza. All right, what's important about Rangia is what they look like. All right, so Rangias, they're what's considered an indexed fossil, meaning they only live during a small interval of time. All right, this is the range of Rangia. All right, strange coincidence there. But they live right here at the very, very top of the Miocene, which around the world, the last half of the Miocene is the prime megalodon cotton layers. All right, this is why they get so many in South Carolina or on the Atlantic coast of Florida, because it's cutting through these high periods here. If I can find ranges, that means those deposits there are megalodon hotspots. All right, so that, that's on my short list right there, because when, the, when these deposits have ranges, it is the dominant claim. Right? You just can't mistake it. Right? They're, they're going to be just you know, every other one you pick up is going to be one of these. All right, so what about the Pliocene stuff? All right, so Pliocene, I've got a good tip for this, a good place to look. But what about this younger time period inside, in the range of Megalodon? Pliocene. Well, we do have the Pliocene strata here, once again, much further south in, in southwest Alabama. Um, we, we have a lot of it. Um, most of the stuff that's been found here, though, has been terrestrial and freshwater, right? So just about all the Pliocene age fossils have ended up being, uh, I mean, you get this like Willie Bino or something like that, you know? So um, it's kind of like the African Serengeti during this time period down there. So I need to find marine stuff. You're not going to find the biggest shark of all time swimming in the rivers or walking on land. I need to find marine deposits. Well, I just happen to stumble on them. You know, being a person that studies sharks too, when people find shark tooth fossils, I'm the person to get referred to, so they're always sending me their teeth. Over the past five, six years, the number of teeth turning up on Dolphin Island has been ridiculous. There's a point where once a week, I was getting somebody sending me teeth for finding right there on the beach. What the heck was going on? So I obviously had to go down there and investigate. And <laughs> what I found out was right behind the Dolphin Island Sea Lab, uh, successive hurricanes and storm surges have washed away that entire beach right behind the Audubon Sanctuary right behind the sea lab, washing away the beach at Fort Gaines, where the city of Dolphin Island said, yeah, we want to fix this. It really should be a really, really nice beach. They commissioned an engineering company to go out here in the Gulf of Mexico and find an area that had just offshore sands that they deemed were perfect. Perfect grain size, perfect shell content, and so forth. Well, it's probably identified spot five miles south, near a place where they worked before when they grudged out the ship channel going into Mobile Bay. They dredged here and they started pumping it onto the beach. Well, that was in 2016, and they dredged an estimated 275,000 cubic meters of sediment to restore a mile and a half of beach. They just pumped it, literally pumped it five miles in. This is what 2016, what the East End of Dolphin Island looked like. Bulldozers and these things, five miles of pipe, pumping this stuff up. 
Right, so what's interesting about this is that they seem to have hit an offshore fossil deposit and they're pumping these fossils on the beach, which is why so many sharks keep returning. So in 2017, I went down there and I started investigating these things. And I published a paper on just the initial sharks that I was finding there. Here's just some. Um, <laughs> this is actually grown down over 60 different fossils of fossil sharks and bony fishes right there on the beach. And every time I go down, we're finding more on, on the list. So a lot of these sharks, because it's a very young time, we're talking about you know, three to three and a half million year old deposits down there. A lot of them are the exact same species of sharks that are still in the Gulf of Mexico today. It's just their fossil versions. For example, these are sand tiger teeth. These are 100% fossilized, but yet they are morphologically identical to the tiger sharks that are in the world today. But for fish tooth plate, eagle ray um, plate here, these are sand tiger teeth, bull shark tooth, great white teeth. You can find two inch great white teeth just walking through the beach. <laughs> it's unbelievable that are fossilized. The two interesting ones turned out to be this one right here and this one right here. All right, that helped me date these deposits. All right, so this one right here is called Cosmopolitan's Hispanics. This name is derived from the Cosmopolitan, we had a worldwide distribution. All right, you can find this particular species all around the world if you have Pliocene sediments and stuff there. And then heavy Persisera, these heavily serrated things, they call them snaggle tooth sharks. These two are extinct, and they went extinct before the last ice age, meaning these shark teeth here are before the last ice age. I see. Yes. The cool about those two sharks is wherever you find these, you also find megalodon. They overlap. When you look at them stratigraphically, <laughs> you find these in the Miocene and the Pliocene around the world. Same age as megalodon. Well, here we have them. <laughs> these two species on the beach of Dalton Island. So there's a chance that a megalodon tooth will be found. I don't expect megalodon teeth to be washed on shore. They're just too big of all. But to be dredged, basically dug up and pumped, very possible. <laughs> so, very unique situation. Um, I have not found any ranges there. Now, that's cool. That means that it's not this time period here. It's got to be then twice. During this time, Megalon was kind of dying out, but there's still a chance because it's still overlap on the ranges. So, yeah, you want to find Megalon to go hunt the beach, pick up the shells, pick up the teeth, you have a chance. All right, so I'll go pin the deposit down definitely to the price. All right, so when I piece all of this together, all right, here are the current insights that we currently know on the evolution of Megalodon based on research in Alabama. All right, so 100 million years ago, we got our first Odonides appearance. So those little cradle land that you can get bigger than an inch tall. They start diversifying over about 40 million years. You get at least a dozen, maybe 14 different species globally. 66 million years ago, dinosaur extinction event. All right, some of these had survived. So we don't know how many of these 14 or so species. And there's probably more species out there, like the ones I've got in nature now. But at least one of those seems to be the Bryant shark that survived. And it's so similar to the stuff on this side of the extinction event. But once they start getting here, again, you are top predator all of a sudden. All right, they're diversifying. They're, uh, they're, they're spreading around the world. So all of a sudden, we in the Danian, that early time period after the death of dinosaurs, that's why we're getting so many different species. All right, so that's cool. But then all of a sudden, about 45 million years ago, some of these species that have evolved over here had to start developing serration. So you get that sloppily serrated Ashwaticus thing. Um, the ones that didn't went extinct. So many extinction events right here, because then all of a sudden, quantitative equilibrium, we first forward in evolution. Right around 45 million years ago, everything is fully serrated, unserrated stuff that was extinct. Well, it's about 28 million years ago, all of a sudden they start losing their side effects. So consistent from 40, almost 20 million years where they look almost identical. No reason to change, and all of a sudden, boom, little tiny side things. All of a sudden, just after that, about 23 million years ago, globally is when Megalodon first appears. So here's your lineage for the past 100 million years of Megalodon, all based on research. I'm going to end it with that and take any questions that anybody might have. I yes. got one that's just jumping out at me. Well, I asked you about the, maybe the reason for the serration development. Yes. Also, what would be the reasoning 
if you have a guess, uh, for the increase in size to the megalodon? Oh, um, there could be a lot of things for that where um, when you're the top predator and there's no size limit how big you can get, um, going after bigger prey, all of a sudden going from fish to whales. Yeah, you know, so it's more advantageous for you to be bigger, easier mm -hmm. to get these whales. Um, and then it, it got to be a megalodon and it was probably just too big to sustain. Probably too when, when, when overnight the ice age comes, when yeah. the water temperatures are dropping. When you are the biggest of the big apex predator, it also has that a caloric content where there's just not enough food out there anymore. So your resources are so depleted. The smaller things are the things that tend to survive extinction events. They don't have to eat as much. Mm -hmm. That's why saber tooth cats went extinct, but then not necessarily want squirrels. Squirrels can eat an acorn and they're good. Saber tooth cats gotta eat quite a bit, or mammoths and mastodons gotta eat quite a bit. They didn't survive. Interesting. I also have been interested recently about citizen science. It sounds like maybe somebody needs to develop a game or something identifying these shark teeth <laughs> so that you can have one repository of all everybody's mantelpiece shark teeth and get them identified. So what's interesting about citizen science is when I teach down at Dolphin Island, I give a lot of lectures down there. I've been training the general public who are either uh, what they call the snowbirds that come down for the winter or their year, yearly residents down there on, on what to look for on the beach. And so not only do you get the shark teeth, which are pretty easy to define because they look like shark teeth, but you get tens of thousands of these little ear stones called otoliths. They're the inner ears of fossil fishes. That every bony fish has them. Cartilaginous ones like shark stones, but any, every bony fish has them, but they're very unique for that species. You can get these little amber looking stones and identify it this species of fish. Hmm. So once I taught them what to look for, because I'm trying to get an inventory from my book of what you can find there on the beach, and it should be a reflection of what's in the Gulf of Mexico is dead. And so we got another 60 so far, but there's over 500 different species of police fish out there, so we got a long way to go. But they're finding hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, even training kids to go out there. Once their eyes are trained, they can find them. So it's a huge, huge resource for me. Um, the reverse of it is I'm able to publish all this stuff and so once I finish my gigantic textbook of these 400 different species, it's an ID guide for everybody now. Yeah. Yeah, question. It was more of an observation. I just thought it was cool during your presentation how, like, we know that uh, mammals were filling the beaches that the dinosaurs left behind. Yes. And it's just cool to see the shark evolution coincide with animal evolution. <laughs> it's like they fed into each other. I, I never made that connection. And that's one of the big steps here. Um, that will happen. Well, if I can get this to work. <laughs> oh, it froze. That's fine. All right. Okay. So, one of the big things that I need to figure out is once I get the whole lineage down and figure out exactly when these major events were happening. Then we'll start looking at what's happening globally, what's happening in environmental and the Gulf of Mexico over the past hundred million years to help give us better insights on why these things, well, why this family had to evolve uh, basically from these tiny things to these huge things. So it, is it, uh, and that, that's like the other fossils that you're finding with them. You know, are they transitioning from a fish diet then to a whale diet and to a manatee diet back to a whale diet? Right now we don't have enough data on that. Um, but that's kind of the next thing. So as I'm collecting shark teeth, I'm collecting all the other fossils with it, kind of leaving those inside. Yeah. How far back can you trace the history of uh, this lineage? Uh, right now, we can take it back to 100 million years. What about the lure? Uh, well, even around the world, we don't get teeth that are shaped like this anymore with the triangular main cusp and side bangs. These seem to be the earliest. So this seems to be the beginning, at least, of this lineage. Now, there are certain things that led up to this, but they look completely different. Um, so, what we call this the crown group, where it is all the, in this case, Megalodon, but then all its direct ancestors. There are things that are much further ancestors, but this is kind of the beginning of it right here, from what we can tell. So, there's lots of deposits that are a whole lot older than 100 million. They just don't have anything that looks like this. So, it's really 100 million years to kind of where we can trace it back. But that's global. So, what did the sharks first start to have the Oh, that was back to the first sharks 450, 500 million years ago. <laughs> so, um, but different species and completely different sharks than different shaped teeth. That's, those, those things, that's a whole different talk. Those things are wild. <laughs>
fascinating to me. It really is. And and from doing this, setting up this program, there's groups. What are the, some of the paleontology or, or just groups that people can join if they're interested? Uh, there's two. So there's the Birmingham Paleo Society that normally meets right here once a month. And there's the Alabama Paleo Society that during non COVID times they meet at the zoo. Open to the general public, small fee, it's like $20 a year, where you get monthly programs, but one to two field trips to take you to fossil sites across the state. So, um, definitely open for kids as well. It's great to kind of get them out in the field. The, the members of, of the club, the ones that have been there for a while, are very, very, very knowledgeable and great guides out in the field. Yeah. I, I'm actually kind of like a new member of the Alabama Theological yeah. Society. And um, I know that they use the meetings too. Uh, for now, yes, they will eventually meet back in person, but right now it's Zoom. But Zoom has really opened it up where <coughs> when you meet in person, it's generally someone local um, in the Birmingham area. So mostly it's me and a few of my colleagues. But with Zoom, they're getting paleontologists from around the country and around the world. So it's unique from that standpoint. I always prefer to talk to people in person, but um, you know, to to talk to really cool paleontologists from elsewhere is very cool. Thank you so much. Oh,